and uh, UNODC for their help in organizing this event, Data for Better Lives. Uh, this is one of the events uh, that is being organized within the uh, context of the recently launched uh, World Development Report 2021, Data on Better Lives. Uh, so the event will start uh, first with a brief presentation uh, by Robert Kahl, one of the co-directors of the WDR 2021 report uh, and me, followed by um, a panel discussion of our uh, distinguished uh, speakers uh, who I will introduce uh, when we uh, get to the panel discussion format. format. Uh, without much ado, I would like to pass the floor to our co-director, uh, uh, Robert Kahl. Uh, the floor is yours, Bob. Thank you. And Ken is handling the presentation, uh, so you could you could just ask him to move to the next slides. Okay, thank you, Muar, uh, and thank you for joining us today and for the opportunity to speak to you about World Development Report 2021, Data for Better Lives. Uh, next slide, Ken. Um, I should start by saying that we set out to uh, write a report that focused not only on digital applications and benefits of participation in the digital economy, but also on how data itself and improvements in its coverage, granularity and timeliness and associated analytics truly hold promise for improving the lives of the poor. And in the first half of the report, we develop a collection of examples illustrating how improving data quality and reusing and repurposing data can and have led to improved development outcomes in terms of monitoring public health, disaster response, improved poverty mapping, which can lead to improvements in targeting and service delivery, monitoring depletion of natural resources, um, and benchmarking progress on important policy priorities such as financial inclusion. So that's just to give you a flavor of the, uh, of the examples that we use to um, illustrate that data really do hold great promise for improving the lives of the poor. Um, next slide. Um, and one more, Ken, please. And it's no secret why this topic was chosen for the WDR. Um, there's been an explosion of data produced and used by various actors. Um, and the report is anchored by a conceptual framework that focuses on three particular groups. Um, there's data received and generated uh, by individuals, civil society and academia. Um, there are data collected and analyzed by governments and international organizations on individuals and firms. And third, there are data that have become increasingly used in and produced as a byproduct of the production processes of firms. Malar, I, I just saw in the chat. Okay, can, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. There was a bit of a sound problem in the beginning. Can okay, you perhaps, me? yeah. Excuse me. I'll try to make sure that I stay close to my microphone. Okay, um, so moving towards the next slide. Um, and, and when data are processed and analyzed by these actors, um, data and digital applications hold the potential to substantially improve development outcomes. Through the top pathway, uh, data can foster transparency, enabling individual civil society and academia to hold governments accountable for policies and programs. Through the middle pathway, data produced, collected, and received by governments and international organizations can enable them to improve policies, design better programs, and improve service delivery. And through the bottom pathway, data are increasingly crucial to the production processes of firms. They foster improved decision-making and facilitate the matching of buyers and sellers, which increases productivity and generates growth. Next slide. But that, that also come with risks that need to be navigated. And so the report recognizes and emphasizes that data can have potential negative development linkages, and that if misused, data can harm people. For example, through the top pathway, data uh, can also enable individuals and organized groups to cause harm through cybercrime that steals and manipulates sensitive information, much of it personal. Through the middle pathway, citizens' data can also be abused by governments for political ends to rig elections, for politically motivated surveillance, or to discriminate against segments of the population. And through the bottom pathway, Firms can abuse consumers' data to engage in forms of anti-competitive price discrimination or manipulative and aggressive marketing techniques. More generally, because of increasing returns to scale, data-driven platform businesses have tended towards market concentration. 
in addition to the fact that a handful of firms are now in possession of a tremendous amount of information about individuals, this concentration can also make it difficult for entrepreneurs from lower income countries to participate in digital markets. Next slide, Ken. Um, in addition, because they are non-rival, data that were initially collected with one intention or purpose can be reused for a completely different one. And thus, data repurposing and reuse are central to the report's conceptual framework. Our, current, our framework contemplates that this type of sharing and reuse could occur between all of the actors that we focus on, as reflected in the two-way arrows connecting them to each other in the center of the figure. Um, next slide. So to develop one of those examples of reuse, repurposing, and combining data in different ways a bit, um, even though lower income countries only have half of the world's vehicles, they account for 90% of the world's traffic fatalities. But a successful experiment from Nairobi, Kenya is showing how better use of existing administrative data in combination with new sources of commercial data is helping to dramatically improve road safety. There, researchers worked with the National Police Service to digitize the paper administrative records of crashes, which they combined with data crowdsourced from tweets to identify and geolocate crashes using natural language processing and geoparsing algorithms. These efforts revealed that only 5% of the roads accounted for 50% of the road traffic deaths in the city. Further insights from Uber and Waze data on average speeds on road segments and on road obstacles, from Google Maps data on land use, and from weather data on driving conditions are being used to further pinpoint and understand crash locations and to modify roads, signage, and traffic rules to reduce fatalities even further. Next slide. Um, citizens can also create data on their own to fill gaps in public and private data to address the problems that they face. Um, time is short, so I'll just develop this briefly. Harass Map is a mobile and online technology nonprofit organization that uses interactive mapping to try to reduce the social acceptability of sexual harassment throughout Egypt. Uh, those who've been witness to such an event um, can report the incident either online or via SMS, email, tweet, Twitter, or Facebook. Harass Map then develops, develops a Google map of Egypt, um, which localizes these incidents and in showing hotspots where they've tended to occur. Harass Map volunteers then visit the areas where these incidents are prone to occur and meet with the people in the area, local shop owners, police officers, doormen, to raise awareness about what constitutes sexual harassment and to work towards ending it. Next slide. And so we're asking the report, will it, what will it take to get more out of data, to enable the sharing and reuse that can unlock greater value from it, but also to safeguard against misuse and harm so that data subjects and users trust in data systems. And at the same time, to ensure that the benefits of data and analytics are shared more equitably with low-income countries and poor individuals. So the broad nature of these questions and concerns points to the need to get all of society to engage in dialogue, uh, developing a social contract for data. And by this, we mean an agreement among all participants in the process of creating, sharing, and reusing data that fosters trust that they will not be harmed and that part of the value created by data will accrue to all equitably. It's about agreeing on the rights and rules governing data use. Now, social contracts have existed for centuries. They're reflected in legal systems across the world, but we need these contracts to adapt to this new world where data is deeply interwoven into our lives. Um, again, because time is short, um, I won't be able to develop this much, but next slide. Um, the social contract in the report is based on three concepts, um, trust, equity, and value. In short, the social contract provides the rules and compliance mechanisms for how data can be shared, used, and reused by all stakeholders to promote greater value, which is rooted in trust that data will not be misused and that the value created, as I said, will be shared equitably. Um, concerns about data equity are particularly relevant for poorer countries, um, for poorer people who are less likely to be reflected in data and to participate in the data uh, economy. And concerns about trust are also particularly salient in poorer countries where institutional and regulatory frameworks that ensure safe and ethical use of data are typically weaker and where, as noted, market concentration in digital platform businesses may make it harder for their firms to participate. So how does this contract manifest itself? Um, next slide. The World Development Report offers an aspirational vision of an integrated national data system, or INDS, 
which can serve to which can serve to enhance data flows across stakeholders. Um, and while it's clear that for most of the countries that are the focus of our report, um, they're going to be very far away from this aspiration. Nonetheless, the report develops the concept of the INDS to provide a clear description of what countries should be aiming for as they take steps towards improving their use of data. Again, time is short, so I'll only be able to sketch this briefly, but next slide, Ken. Um, in our vision of the INDS, um, data are on the top row here, produced, protected from misuse, open, meaning accessible and usable to all, quality control and used and reused as we've developed uh, a bit here in this talk so far. Um, on the second row, uh, it shows that all participants in a well-functioning INDS both create and share data, including all the actors that we've spoken about. Um, in the third row, um, the report envisions four key pillars that support the INDS enable it to function, which include infrastructure to ensure that people are connected to and can use data systems, laws and regulations to protect personal data, which are grounded in a human rights framework and protection of the data systems on which people and organizations depend. Uh, economic policies, particularly regarding antitrust, trade and taxation to ensure that poor countries get more out of their data domestically and gain from their participation in digital markets internationally. And finally, in the third row, the last entry is the institutions of data governance, which are the tools established for essentially supporting and, for, and enforcing the social contract for data. Underlying those four pillars, which you can't really see in the bottom row of this slide, and so I won't dwell on it too much, um, are five key foundations that enable the whole structure to work. Um, these include human capital to understand the potentials of data, positive and negative, um, and it's rooted in robust data literacy. Uh, that generates data demand, demand for high quality data and the incentives to produce it. This is all rooted in trust in the quality of the data and trust that people won't be, mis won't be harmed by um, divulging their data. All of this takes planning uh, and dedicated funding streams. So in short, this sketch is supposed to indicate that the aspirational INDS is built on an intentional whole of government and multi-stakeholder approach to data governance. To expand on the elements of what we mean by data governance, I hand it over to our report manager, Malar Barapanko. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much, Ken. Next slide. So as Bob um, uh, it talked about the principles of the social contract, so what does it take to implement these principles? And how do we go from this conceptual nature of a social contract to creating the ambitious integrated data system? All this requires tremendous improvements in data governance frameworks in all countries. In the report, we discuss the data governance framework as a series of four layers that build upon and support one another. And um, you see the four layers on the screen. And today I will provide a very brief presentation on each of the pillars. Um, next slide. The first pillar is the data infrastructure policy that supports access to data. This is particularly important to meet the goal of equity in the social contract. This includes both policies that make it possible for people to connect to internet data services and the policies that ensure that countries have adequate infrastructure to exchange, store, and process data efficiently over the internet. Individuals need to have access to essential data infrastructure without which their data is not captured, nor can they access the data of others. In addition to discussing the supply side barriers of universal coverage, which is very important, of course, we also focus on demand side barriers in the report, which is the fact that people are often failing to access data services, not because they don't live close to a signal, but because they cannot afford handsets or data charges or simply lack the data literacy to take advantage of these services. Along with connecting individuals to data services, the policies that ensure that countries have adequate national data infrastructure, uh, for example, uh, I, internet exchange points, co-location data centers, and increasingly access to cloud computing facilities to exchange, store, and process data over the internet are also important. This is all to say is that infrastructure policies are fundamentally very critical to ensuring both poor countries and poor people are connected to the data infrastructure. Next slide, please. The second layer is laws and regulations governing the use and reuse of data. In the report, we discussed this in, within the framework of uh, safeguard, safeguards and enablers, and for both personal and non-personal data. We advocate for taking a balanced development of 
safeguards and enablers. Uh, by safeguards, we are referring to cybersecurity and protection of personal and non-personal data and regulation of cross-border data flows. By enablers, we are talking about regulations that supports value creation, providing access to both public and private intent data, as well as supporting electronic uh, transactions. Um, one of the contributions of this report is a data regulation survey, uh, which helps us to analyze the performance across different dimensions of a data regulation. The survey is intended to be used as a diagnostic tool to review performance against uh, different dimensions of data regulations and unpack the underlying nuances. Um, uh, next slide, Ken. For example, the issue of cybersecurity is a persistent gap we see in many countries across the world and is a major concern, which is leading to huge economic damages estimated to close to um, $100 billion just in the US. We observe that while countries do well in establishing cybersecurity regulations and um, CSIRT response times, these tend to lag behind in enforcing the application of cybersecurity regulations on data controllers and, and on automatic, um, automatic data processing. Uh, this calls for a strong data protection framework for personal data that is grounded in human rights framework, which demands individual rights for data protection are first protected through seeking individual consent before the data is used for any purposes. This approach, of course, does entail some significant costs for both firms in terms of monetary costs for compliance with the regulations, but also for individuals who may not necessarily fully understand the terms of the consent presented to them. The non-personal data is protected through inter intellectual property rights framework. Uh, we also find uh, that the protection of non-personal data lags behind in most countries. For example, in the slide that you're looking at, uh, th this is uh, um, an one of the analysis from the data regulation survey uh, that plots the different dimensions of data regulation um, by income groups. Uh, and you see that um, uh, how the development of non-personal data regulation is still uh, uh, under a lot of progress in, in most of the countries. And this is a concern considering the increasing blurry boundary between personal and non-personal data. The other aspects of laws and regulatory framework are enablers, which allow data to be used, reused, shared, and repurposed. Here we find progress in e-commerce enablers, as well as open data and access to information legislation on the public sector side. But of course, for open, open data to be meaningful, access to information policies and open data by default policies and data classifications need to also be developed simultaneously. Uh, and you can also see from this that there's very little progress still in enabling private sector data use, which is a much more challenging issue. Next slide. The third layer is the economic policies that are affected by data. We emphasize that data regulations have knock-on effects on the real economy. There is market concentration in data-driven businesses. We find that about half a dozen major US data companies account for 40% of the global data traffic and two thirds of top visited 25 websites in low and middle income countries. Um, uh, yeah, this huge concentration makes it difficult for new entrants in low and middle income countries to break into the market. So antitrust becomes, an, becomes important. And um, in some cases, data sharing between firms, uh, basically proactive data sharing between firms becomes potentially an important regulatory tool for promoting competition and this has been uh, tried in some of the landmark uh, cases, for example, in the Uber Kareem case in uh, Egypt. We also see tremendous opportunities for trade and data enabled services. This is the fast growing area in trade. It's growing twice as fast as other service trade over the last 20 years. Here, the issue of safeguards on personal data uh, protection becomes important as personal data crosses borders as part of trade. Um, we find a wide reg a range of regulatory approaches uh, from open transfers. Uh, that is followed in US to more regulated transfers uh, using GDPR frameworks and also countries that are using more restrictive policies for cross-border flows. Um, and, and this is uh, discussed much more detailed in the report. Finally, taxation of data platform businesses is another important part of the equity agenda because we find low and middle income country governments either don't have clear rights to tax uh, Profits accruing in their markets from data-driven businesses are they are unable to levy value-added taxes due to administrative complexities. Uh, this calls for global agreements, both on uh, international um, tax treaties as well as trade agreements on cross-border uh, data-enabled services. Finally, uh, the fourth pillar is the institutional ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please, Ken. 
uh, can ensure that data delivers on the potential uh, by implementing and enforcing the laws, regulations, and po policies pertinent to the other three layers. Um, there are you know, several new demands uh, on the institutions that, are, that exist today and, new, and, and in terms of um, new functions, new governance functions that are expected of them. And so the role of key institutional arrangements such as national statistical offices are being um, uh, you know, rethought Data, new data protection uh, authorities are being set up and new arrangements such as data intermediaries, uh, for example, data trusts are being experimented in, um, uh, in, in some regions. This is all to say that um, uh, there is no one institutional blueprint. I think um, each country decides how the institutional uh, ecosystem develops in its uh, in, uh, taking into account its uh, local context and social norms. But irrespective of this um, uh, mod, and irrespective of the model a country chooses to follow to meet the evolving needs of data governance, um, next slide, please. The institution, um, next slide, please, Ken. Um, uh, institutions and actors, um, uh, the report discusses that needs to have certain features, uh, which is leadership. Uh, that supports and believes in the value of data and brings in a culture of data use uh, within in, in organizations and between different institutions within a country, the technical capacity, resources and incentives um, in order to fully harness the value of data. Finally, we discussed the importance of multi-stakeholder governance, um, since again, the roles of even actors and the importance of, we see the private sector and civil society data has become important. Uh, especially in the context of the pandemic. So we view going forward, um, this, is a, this becomes more of a multi-stakeholder governance that is collaborative, coordinated, and mutually reinforcing um, uh, in, in terms of how this is all, uh, the policies are tailored to frameworks uh, based on the local context. Um, in each of these areas, we underscore the fact that while social contract is primarily a national affair for each society to work out among its stakeholders, there are important dimensions of the social contract which are most effectively and efficiently dealt with in the international manner, which whether it is, includes bilateral cooperation, regional collaboration, or global or multilateral initiatives. Um, next slide, please, Ken. Um, I just want to present just a summary of some of the key messages. I won't go over them. Um, but uh, just very, maybe just one quick highlight is that there is definitely a new social contract for data that is needed that is based on value, trust, and equity. And uh, we, have, we do have a long way to go to in, uh, on data governance. Uh, and at the same time, we should aspire to this vision of the integrated national data system. Um, thank you all. With that, uh, I hope this presentation was useful. Uh, next slide, Ken. Uh, you could, of course, visit the website, download the report, um, and uh, do write to us if, if you want to continue to share your stories on how you're using data. Uh, with, the, with the presentation now, I would like to move on to the panel discussion. Um, this is the next part of today's event. Um, with that, I would, uh, I would introduce the panel members as I invite them to provide their interventions. Uh, I'm really super thrilled to have a, a, a very, um, uh, a really good group of people who are going to bring in very varied uh, perspectives. Um, first, I would like to turn to um, uh, Julio Santaya, who is the president of Inegi Mexico. Um, and he's been a big champion for uh, data and statistics, uh, leading his institution uh, in the production and the use of data in, in very innovative ways. Uh, welcome uh, today to the event. Uh, we're really super glad you're joining um, us. So your country has been a leader in building innovative national data systems that have transformed, transformed the way you're delivering public services. Um, if you can uh, share your views on how this has improved people's lives, in particular in the area of crime statistics, and what can other countries learn from Mexico's experience and how you've been able to adapt to the pandemic times as well uh, as it's thrown many challenges your way. Uh, over to you, uh, Leo. Um, Thank you, thank you, uh, Malar. Um, I want to say hello to uh, the other uh, panelists, uh, to Angela, uh, long friend, and, and Rory. And uh, before answering the, the topics that you uh, mentioned, I want to congratulate the World Bank for this World Development Report 
Uh, I think it's an outstanding work and a very timely call of action in order to exploit the full potential of data. And I think as uh, we can expect usually from the, the World Bank, it has gone to the frontier in terms of analysis and proposals, very innovative. And this idea of a social contract, I think it's very important. So congratulations in, in this case to, to uh, you, Malar and, and Robert and all the World Bank team for that. Let me then turn into your, your particular questions. Um, we have uh, basically over the last uh, three decades investing in expanding statistics in, in different dimensions. Over the last decade, we have uh, engaged into actual work into the area of governance, security and justice, all crime statistics. Now we have um, a very good uh, survey on victimization that it's uh, worldwide recognized and it's become a reference for, for the region. And of course, we have uh, expanded our knowledge and our access to different sources of data. Uh, we have also collecting a national government censuses where we're trying to exploit and characterize administrative records for uh, government institutions in order to have a, a complete picture of, of governance and that. Now, these efforts I'm sure have uh, had a positive impact on improving individual uh, and government decisions. The whole idea in, in Mexico is that data should be the basis for uh, policy making and decisions also at the uh, non-government uh, level. So uh, for instance, we have a, a very good um, geospatial map for business location. And there we can relate to uh, crime and violence trends. So this is one of the most popular applications for uh, business and, and entrepreneurial decisions uh, where we can uh, cross to uh, different criminal activity. Now, in terms of, of public policy, I'm uh, very glad to see that uh, our victimization survey that we call MVP has been already um, formalized as an input to allocate and distribute a budget, the federal budget across Mexican states and municipalities. So uh, this is a clear example where uh, data actually help uh, to allocate resources and in this way to create the right incentives in order to uh, um, adopt uh, meaningful policies. And I, I will also mention uh, our uh, another important very uh, survey, which we carry on every five years. It's a national survey of the dynamics of household relationships. It's the one that uh, focuses on violence against the women. And this has also been very important to show uh, what kinds of violence have occurred and what uh, environments do they occur, whether it's at school or at, uh, at, at the community level. We're about to uh, launch the collection of this survey and then uh, to understand the, the, the evolution of violence against the women through the pandemic is going to be very important. And I want to close with, with a couple of surveys that uh, deal on corruption and the quality of public services. Uh, these show, for instance, the huge gap that there is between perception of corruption and actual events. But however, there's um, a feedback loop between these two things, uh, the, the, the actual events and the perception, how they, they feed each other. And of course, these uh, two uh, surveys show uh, what are the most frequent government interactions or public transactions where corruption is more frequent, such as bribing the police, and therefore highlights the importance of having electronic uh, transactions to avoid human contact in these uh, transactions. So I think this is an example of how we can uh, deliver information that can benefit uh, public decision-making and be the basis of evidence-based policy, public policy. Thank you. That's, that's uh, really interesting. And you touched upon so many different aspects of what we frame public intent data that comes out of 
public se sector in, in institutions and the innovations that you're bringing, um, you know, from the perspective of uh, improving uh, public service delivery. I want to now turn to Rory McMillan, um, uh, whose bio has been shared in the chat. So welcome, uh, Rory. And you are kind of at the forefront of advising so many organizations, both government and private sector, on this sort of, uh, you know, new age <laughs> of data governance challenges. So while Julia talked about all the innovations from the public sector institutions, you know, aspect of it, um, I want to turn to you to say, uh, to see what, you, what your thoughts are on the role of private sector in creating this new social contract for data. I mean, what can private sector do to enable creation of value from data while preventing misuse? Um, you know, there was a question again uh, here from chat, which I'll leave into this question maybe uh, to you about building data and digital infrastructure, you know, especially in poor countries where where you have network outages or, uh, you know, with the lack of basic infrastructure is, is lacking, how do you connect then, you know, how do we do this interoperability, you know, you're connecting data sets. Over to you, Rory. Sure, do you hear me okay? Yep, good. Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Really, uh, it's a wonderful conference. Um, so, private sector contribution role in the social contract. I mean, I immediately think as a regulatory lawyer, I think of the words that Julio just used, incentives. Um, how do you get the incentives right for private sector really to be effective in using data in a way that is good for the social, uh, for, the, for, for the overall social benefit? Uh, let me tell you a bit about, a, just an example in Brazil that we've been looking at. Um, so Brazil took some helpful steps um, uh, not so long ago to reform its credit, uh, consumer credit reporting agency rules, requiring telecom operators to uh, report into um, the, the credit uh, bureau system to make available information that the telecom operators held. Um, and uh, by, by doing this, they opened up a large amount of data that's extremely useful for digital financial services. So we're in the middle of the pandemic. We're seeing global demand for digital financial services because it allows you to move resources around. It allows people to get access to credit, which will see them through uh, really a personal financial crisis. Um, but it, digital financial services are also highly useful for what Julio also mentioned, uh, dealing with corruption, payments, tracking payments, formalizing the informal economy. So um, the steps that Brazil took were very useful in improving access to credit in particular. Um, the, you want to make data available to enable uh, the profiling of uh, people to understand their reliability, their willingness, their ability to repay, and yet you don't want to make uh, de uh, data available in a way that um, betrays their privacy, that tells everybody where those people are. Um, so how do you do that? Well, Brazil uh, required some reporting into the credit um, agencies, but also allowed um, telecom operators to provide access to Yes, to location data of individuals, to billing payment data that those individuals had, to their telecom usage. Um, but they did it in a way which uh, allowed um, a, a firm, in this case called Signify, to access the data through just interrogating the raw data and looking for yes, no answers to, to questions that they had. They didn't themselves get direct access to the data. Um, but in doing so, they were able to confirm identities of individuals to be able to uh, uh, eliminate fraudulent transactions um, and, uh, and, and improve credit worthiness decisions. So um, this is an example where the private sector actor comes in, you've got data, it's private intent data held by telecom operators, it's got a private sector data analytics firm that's uh, analyzing it for the purpose of, of, of lenders using it, also private sector. What are the, what are the kind of key lessons that, that come out of this sort of example? Well, one is key, key priority is getting access in the first place to data. An awful lot of data is simply just not available. It's tied up in silos, um, different government departments, different companies. It's very costly to compare, to combine. It's not homogenous. So it takes private sector firms with some incentive to go and dig it out and, and pull it together. And this isn't new. If you look back at, in, the, in the 1830s in the United States, the Tappan brothers went off and started interviewing all sorts of businesses about other businesses and built a huge, uh, a huge database um, written, of course, with ledgers analyzing different businesses' uh, um, uh, records of, of repaying debt. And they 
systematized it, abstracted it, gave points to businesses um, according to their evaluation of their credit worthiness and made that available. Now that, that kind of activity has been you know, around now for quite a lengthy time. And the, the key step that comes after that is introducing regulation on the back of access to that data and how they, how they organize it. Um, there's a sort of a wave that comes where you need this incentive of the private sector coming in, and then you need to kind of harness it for the social good in case it goes a little bit off the rails, which I think a lot of policymakers would say is happening in the digital advertising space, for example, with some of the big tech platforms. Um, the, other, the other kind of um, uh, lessons I think would come out of this are, uh, you, need, um, you need access to this on scale um, where, where possible. So where you can really tap into large institutions like um, telecom data, uh, large banks, financial data, um, this, is, this is where the real power of data is. So releasing that, but in a way, and this is the last, the last lesson I'll, I'll refer to right now, in a way that achieves what, what Malar mentioned as one of the three uh, key pillars of, 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 the, of the World Development Report is trust. Um, because trust, trust in, the, in, in this space is it's essential to one of the other um, key pillars, which is value. Um, this goes to the misuse question that you posed, Malar. Um, what is misuse? Um, is, it, is it simply where someone's making a profit off of data about a person? Well, not really. That's really been how people have acted in commerce since we've known about commerce. Um, is it about how data is used when another person wasn't expecting it that way? Well, perhaps it's more along those lines. Um, but trust is really central to, um, to, 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 to creating value of the data because if you don't have that trust, people will begin to hold it back. But you also need trust in the data itself. Um, so you need mechanisms for ensuring that the data is going to be trustworthy. It's going to be sufficiently up to date. It's going to be sufficiently accurate. And that's where institutions come in and that's where private sector bodies are able to be, um, to, be to, to build uh, cross industry standards, which, which ensure that. Um, so I'll leave it at that because I could go on for a long time about that. But that, you know, I think the private sector has a huge amount of data. It has the technology and it needs the incentives to run with it. And if with a bit of harnessing and a bit of nudging and then some hardcore regulations, um, you can achieve the kind of social benefits that we're, we're all looking for. Back to you, Malar. Thank you, Rory. I mean, I think two great points takeaways from, uh, from um, your really uh, interesting intervention is that no notion of incentives. I think, uh, you know, I think that incentive problem is gonna be the difficult one to crack for private sector, it's also for public sector, you know, it seems like it's, it's very pertinent to all uh, stakeholders. Uh, and then this notion of data quality um, being really important for trust. Uh, you know, you have to make people should believe in the data that institutions are putting out, whether it's private sector or public sector or whoever is converting that data into information that is also trustworthy. Uh, so we'll circle back again to that discussion. I think uh, uh, we won't steer too far away, but I want to now turn to Angela. Um, uh, who is the Chief of uh, Research and Statistics at UNODC. And again, her bio is going to be uh, uh, in the uh, chat window. Welcome again, Angela. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I want to now turn to you, you know, who you talked about the you know, core data statistics uh, produced by the public sector, who you talked about the private sector dimension. There's also another dimension often, I feel like sometimes we don't talk about as much is, some of the types of data that you curate at uh, UNODC, uh, you know, what, what, what I came to actually really learn this only in my conversations with you is this transnational data sets, uh, data on, uh, you know, some of the important data on drugs, trafficking in persons that are critical, uh, but that's not really connect, you know, collected within countries. It, it has that international dimension to it. Um, uh, you know, you know, you have that that's going on uh, on one side, but then more and more you hear these challenges with the data collection um, uh, related to uh, you know issues around uh, cross-border data flows, countries you know wanting to keep their data within their boundaries, you know this notion of data localization. It just seems like the challenges just become much more when you're curating these data sets that are more uh, you know that transcends borders. So I, I'm just keen to hear from you how do you view these challenges shaping the future of how you you know, continue to collect and use data on crime statistics uh, in the work that you do. 
Thank you, Malar. And really, well, good afternoon from here in Vienna, but good morning to you in uh, the US or Mexico. Uh, hi, Julio, you know, it's great uh, to be in the same panel, great partner and friend. And hi, um, Rory, nice to meet you virtually. Uh, before, I, before I answer your question, Malar, I wanted to say something that uh, uh, trigger in your presentation of the report. Um, and one is relating to uh, cybercrime. And uh, just to say that uh, member states uh, are uh, discussing now, both in Vienna and New York, uh, the possibility of developing a convention on cybercrime. So I think that is really the critical time where uh, you know, we could uh, make a difference also and say, okay, what does it mean? It could, sh should have a data dimension, the way how that you have described them. And you know, the need of having this international cooperation and transnational principles uh, that uh, can be. So that could be the first, uh, uh, is a great opportunity just that uh, we can take as an international community. Now, getting back to your question. Well, you know, crime has been and continues and increasingly be transnational. Uh, and so, you know, if maybe 50 years ago, uh, you know, the main issue with crime, and you would see also the criminology societies and academics really focusing a lot on what, what we today call uh, the traditional crime, uh, robberies, um, uh, you know, thefts, and, and so on. Today, the real challenge that also faced by people uh, every day is an issue relating to the transnationality of the criminal activities. And, uh, you know, criminal groups um, uh, cooperate uh, very easily and uh, with really no border. And, um, and so we need to respond with the same transnational dimension uh, in addressing the response, but also if we want to understand it, we need to understand it in, in a way that goes beyond national borders. And uh, that has, uh, in a way, two dimensions, two challenges uh, in order to do this. One uh, is uh, to uh, transband, uh, you know, to see the notion of uh, data, um, not just as national data. And, you know, with Julio, we have been uh, in, involved in the statistical, in the international statistical system for many years. And there is also a lot of, uh, I would say, rightly so, pride and uh, to say, a national statistical office or national statistical system need to oversee the national data. And so they own the data. It's this idea that uh, you know, countries they have their own data and they are the custodian of their own data. And I think also one of the challenges when we go transnational is uh, to see how we can uh, work with countries to also understand that uh, today, if we really want to, to, to face uh, the, the problem of today, we need to work together. So in a way, beyond, uh, uh, if you want, uh, national ownership, ownership in general, uh, and as you said it in your in the presentation of the book, not only in terms of, uh, I would say, I would bring your notion of uh, data ownership that is not only relevant to one specific national institution, I would take it to a higher level and say, if we can think about in terms of even beyond uh, uh, the national. Uh, and to, in a way, understanding that um, each uh, national dimension needs to lose a little bit in order to gain a much bigger picture. Uh, and so, so that is, I think, one, if you want the political will to understand and to think about uh, working together, and that's where I was glad to see, you know, your focus on international cooperation, working together to create that transnational data system. The other challenge is the technical, is more on the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the thing that uh, National Statistical Office have their own traditional way of uh, building. And so it's, uh, it's more challenging now to change them and to make them more comparable. But we have been working and with INEGI, we have partnered and the Center of Excellence has been keen in the region, for example, to implement the international classification of crime for statistical purposes. That, for example, is the tool that can help us uh, to create uh, that common uh, framework uh, uh, on crime where we can exchange data, where we can see uh, you know, data and again. The other technicality, if you want that, is a mix between a technical issue and a more political um, certainly is again to understand this uh, uh, idea that one country can collect data on something that is happening in another country. And I give you an example. 
We have uh, in UNODC, we manage a, a series of uh, data collection system. And I give you an example, for example, on drugs, uh, but also on trafficking person, uh, et cetera. And uh, we, you know, in order again to understand this transnational dimension, uh, we need, for example, we ask Mexico and we say, uh, where do the victims of trafficking person come from that you identify in Mexico? Uh, where is the cocaine that you see in Mexico is coming from? Uh, and so what happens uh, is that, uh, uh, for example, Mexico may be able to see what is happening uh, in other Latin American countries that those Latin American countries don't see because uh, the victims have already crossed. Uh, like, for example, today in Latin America, we have seen clearly from the data from the countries in Latin America, an increase uh, of victims of trafficking person coming from Venezuela. These victims probably will not be recorded or Venezuela may not be able to say we have an increase in trafficking person. But with the help of information that we gain from the other countries, we can see that that is uh, an increase uh, uh, challenge. So that uh, uh, is the, uh, I will leave it with that uh, uh, notion of this uh, idea of a transnational, you mentioned the idea of a national data system. Eh? So I wanted to challenge you back uh, on developing the idea of an international data system. Thank you, Angela. And I think uh, you absolutely make that very important point about, uh, you know, not just coordination, uh, but I guess even going a step, you know, ahead of coordination and really making, uh, you know, uh, bringing people together at the international level. And I think we've kind of partially faced that as a multi-stakeholder governance, but I think it's something, I, th I think we're hoping there'll be more dialogues as to see how this will actually come into, you know, action in, in reality in the coming days as we talk with the different, uh, you know, as, as we all different stakeholders talk about it. Um, and, and you really brought some really interesting points about, um, you know, gender-based violence, you know, how even this tracking of information, how this, you know, this, is, this needs to be done again in different, across different countries and how that data, um, you know, is exchanged and used in a way that, you know, it has actually direct impact on people, people's lives. Um, so with that, I'm going to go in a little bit of a reverse order now and start with Rory. Um, with a question to you, Rory, I want to come back. Um, is that we talked about incentives, and Angela talked about this, you know, the movement of really very personal data even across countries, and and we all know that uh, it's it's a bit of a daunting challenge now for regulators and companies to navigate these challenges, and even before legislation, I think um, industry plays an important role in determining technical standards, codes of conduct, uh, and market principles. So what are some of the regulatory challenges that the industry is grappling with today? Um, and what can the government do to enhance the regulatory framework for data in a way that supports innovation and value creation uh, in the public sector? You know, kind of keeping some of these maybe examples in the, in the mm. back. Yes, I, I was struck by Angela's comments about um, cross-border data. And, um, you know, I, well, firstly, private sector is facing huge challenges with the changes of laws that are going on it really is a sweeping wave of, of data protection laws coming in some vital sectors health um, finance in particular uh, telecommunications already had laws of protecting how data is handled um, we're now seeing generic um, laws meaning applying across the entire economy um, being introduced, which is creating a lot of uncertainties and confusion around uh, different uh, uh, obligations and how they all fit together. Um, one of the areas where this is is is, is a real strong impact is um, cross border, um, and and this is this is really vital where the, the complexities um, are, are are huge. You may have data about an individual in one country um, being collected by a service provider who's in another country. Um, which may be holding the data, transferring it into a data center in a third country, and then using a, a specialist um, processor for whatever purposes in a fourth country. Um, and, 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 it, and the list of potential um, complexities goes on there. And the, the thing is that actually an awful lot of that activity is good. It's useful, it's efficient, it's helpful, it's providing services very often to individuals and you want to encourage that. But at the same time, Countries are understandably anxious that information about their people 
is being held abroad by those who are beyond their jurisdictional reach, who they, they don't have the means to control them. Um, and when that begins to happen at scale, if you have service providers from another country who really know everything about your population, where they live, what their names are, what their medical conditions are, what their jobs are, how much they earn, uh, where they physically are location-wise, day in, day out, that becomes a national security issue. For, for, for countries at that level, it's potential. So you, so you sort of see TikTok being banned, for example, in the United States for that kind of reason last year. Um, so, and yet you really want to enable this data to move across the borders because especially in lower income countries, um, if you don't, you, the data cannot be put to use. And I think there's a real risk, maybe to come back to another uh, concept Angela mentioned, the, the notion of ownership. I think we're seeing quite a strong, um, wave of sentiment that says, well, this is data about us, we own it somehow, we should, we should somehow control it, keep it to ourselves. And I think there's a big risk in, in, in over, over emphasizing that, 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 that approach, because lower income countries typically will not alone be able to make the real value out of the data if it's kept um, uh, domestically. The data processing capabilities um, uh, at scale are likely to be abroad and you need to combine data with other data. You need to aggregate it to be able to, to make true value out of the training data, the artificial intelligence really to, 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 to get the insights you need. So there's a really important need, um, whether it's for um, a humanitarian or development um, purposes. I'm thinking, for example, the case in Malawi we were looking at where UNICEF wanted access to location data of people from telecom operators um, in order to know where to put the clinics um, for, 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 for vaccinations. Um, but they couldn't just go and get that data, which, and they wanted to transfer it out of the country because they had servers in the Netherlands and, and elsewhere. So they had to go and ask permission from the regulatory authority that handled data, which delays everything. And uh, that's the sort of thing where you would think an, an organization with good data protection policies ought to be able to have the data to to cross borders. Um, another example is where we're looking to develop um, cross-border commerce, cross-border digital financial services. Um, you need a lot of information about identity um, and, uh, uh, and orders um, to, to be able to cross borders. So there, there are a lot of reasons to enable um, data to cross border. So, so that's, a, that's one major theme, I think, which is really important for the private sector. Others are you know, the requirements to get consent left, right, and center, which given the kind of um, consent is broken uh, concern we have, that it's not really effective because everyone just gives consent. There's a lot of burden placed on companies trying to get consent, which is not really a useful thing anyway. Um, another area is data protection laws, which are re uh, requiring uh, firms to provide access to individuals all the time to be able to correct the data. It's very useful, very important, and very important discipline. And yet that sort of ubiquitous obligation when it's not proportionate can actually impose a lot of costs and, and become a barrier again, a barrier to, to the using of data. So, you know, basic point is um, some laws are perhaps going a little bit too far and holding back um, the, the healthy use of data you know, some, some are downright poorly drafted and so private sector is really stuck. Um, you know, Uganda's law says you may not sell personal data. Uh, well, boom, that's kind of the end of an awful lot of potentially useful activity. Or Pakistan says, there's a bill currently that says if the law is, if, if the data is encrypted, then it doesn't count as personal data for protection purposes. So suddenly you've got a whole bunch of personal data that's not going to be protected. Um, which is really not appropriate. So there's a lot of you know, work needs to be done to get the laws right to enable private sector to use the data well under good discipline. Um, so I think an awful lot of this is in is in that realm, but work in progress, and you know we're we're moving forward. Anyway, back to you. Thank you, Rory. Yeah, no, I think just the way you described just shows the extent of work we have actually ahead of ourselves. Uh, I think it's not meant to. Uh, show how daunting it is. It is, but at the same time, I think it's important to recognize and you know move forward, taking into these challenge challenges into account. So I want to actually go back to Julio now, just to give your perspective, how you see um, some of these challenges. Because Julio, the COVID crisis has has definitely you know put a spotlight on the critical role data is playing in pandemic response. 
but it is also uh, you know, shed light on the existing data gaps and inequalities. I mean, you hear a lot of uh, store, I mean, you know, publications talking about the lack of gender disaggregated data, um, uh, you know, still, you know, in, in, on just on the case data, but also on other types of data that are typically being collected, uh, you know, data on like basic identification um, uh, coming out of identification systems. Uh, and so in this report, so, you know, while you have that on the one hand, and then Rory talked about the potential of bringing data together, which is something we also talked about in the report, which is data synergies, bringing together these uh, different types of data uh, to unlock innovations. So how do you build that? I mean, that's a lot of technical capacity that you need to build within institutions. So how do you, how do you uh, think about, um, you know, this notion of building technical capacity within institutions like NSOs, uh, uh, especially with limited, limited resources. And this gets even more harder in, country, in fragile countries uh, that are already, you know, uh, what you call, uh, you know, uh, have a, a problem with weak capacity inherently. Uh, over to you. Thank you, uh, Malar. This has been a very uh, interesting uh, discussion about uh, different topics. I really enjoyed uh, Angela's talk about uh, transnational data. And at some point I want to come back where uh, there's been actually an increase in demand for more granular data. I mean, for instance, the pandemic required a precise knowledge of where contagion is happening. And that brings down the, the data needs to the city level or the community. So, so this is a completely different uh, dimension of the problems that we have. Uh, and Rory also talked about uh, the challenges facing the the private sector. And of course, that puts our um, national statistical systems into uh, a different uh, difficult situation because uh, they're, in order to uh, fulfill all the potential of these data synergies, we have to have these uh, agreements with, between the data providers, the data processors, and the data users. And basically, that's a social compact that you're uh, advocating in the World Development Report. Now, it's it not easy to achieve that. Of course, you need uh, first a legal framework. Uh, in our case in INECI, we do have a widespread mandate, but uh, the private sector data, it's not always within our reach. So we have to come up with certain uh, arrangements, agreements in order to uh, figure out what data we could actually use. And in this case, there were, in the pandemic, there were two very important data needs. First one had to do with mortality. Uh, we want to know, we wanted to know the extent of the pandemic in terms of the health impact, and of course, uh, the consequences in terms of, of social, economic, and other well being important indicators. But our uh, mortality statistics were not sufficiently timely in order to get that information. So we had to come up with different arrangements using different data sources to study the same phenomenon. So we had to rely not only on admin records, but also on uh, funerary agencies. Uh, we also had to rely on uh, public sector cemeteries in order to have a different perspective on mortality by trying to to unleash these data synergies in order to understand this phenomenon. Another very important instance was uh, economic performance. Uh, many authorities wanted to know basically in real time the impact of the lockdowns on economic activity, on labor markets, on employment, and therefore on the well-being on, uh, of households. But our economic statistics were not timely enough. So we had to uh, rely on uh, alternative sources of information. We had to move beyond and uh, think outside the box and come up with uh, now casting models. And in these now casting models, private sector information becomes very important. We had some partnerships with uh, telecom uh, participants, telecom industries. Uh, we had also a relationship with uh, financial sector uh, companies, uh, but these were not uh, complete, so we could not rely 100% uh, on this data. Uh, nevertheless, we were able to have, have some information important to do these now casting models. 
So in a way, what I want to say that uh, the national statistical offices have to have the capacity and the trust in our, with society, with government, with the private sector in order to engage into these other activities. And there's, that requires, for instance, a good uh, business continuity plan and data recovery plans, a good human capital and other resources and a legal framework within our institutions, within our systems that allows in terms of crisis to rely and outreach other sectors in order to have a, 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 a complete use and reuse of the data that we see in the ecosystem. Uh, thank you. That was really interesting, Julio. I might come back to probe a little bit more. And I think that'd be really valuable to hear more about how you're able to sort of adapt to these demands, which is what institutions are doing. But I also want to pick up on the point that you talked about. I think something Rory also talked about is like trust and trustworthy uh, in, in data and in institutions. So um, Angela, I want to come back to you on that. Opinion polls now show that you know, across the world, trust in institutions is very low today. In low and middle income countries, data systems, um, you know, how they balance the desire to make data more widely available with the need to prevent misuse of data and, and, and foster trust. So there is, there is that debate of that balance. Uh, and it seems like, I mean, we're continuing to see not that much trust in, 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 in institutions or in the data that, that is being put out. In fact, surprisingly, we see more um, data intermediaries who, who seem to have more success in, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, building that trust, right? I mean, you, you get up in the morning and you look for COVID case data, you're almost almost going to an intermediary website rather than a public institution's website. So what are your thoughts on that? And, and what, can, what can countries do, or what, what should we all be doing to, um, to, to bring this balance, but at the same time, bring trust um, in the data and, and trustworthiness? Interesting. Yes, uh, uh, Mala. Of course, my again, my thought uh, is again from more of a perspective of a statistics, because that's where uh, you know businesses. Uh, um, and just before I again answer your question, I want to go back to Julio. Definitely, there is also the local dimension, and that's the challenge. But you know, now today, some local dimension crime can only be understood at transnational level. Think about the violence even in Mexico. That uh, you know, it, it, so. But that's exactly the challenge on how you know you spread this too, um, and also because uh, often the response to crime is very local. Uh, you know, all crime prevention, etc., tend to be more local than, uh, of course, uh, national. But uh, okay, just to uh, definitely is a good point. So the trust again, and I'm I'm, I'm looking at uh, the length of uh, crime statistics, and I would say the number one is transparency. And uh, the, you know, the, you know that the Open Data Watch, they have uh, this inventory that they do, and uh, in a way they rank uh, the different areas relating to the SDGs uh, in terms of open data. The, uh, the homicide, so the crime area has the lowest rank across all the, the other area of statistics. That really shows how, in a way, crime, and it is still looked in some countries uh, as an issue of uh, state uh, security. And so there is definitely a lot of data that is state security and should remain state security because that allows law enforcement uh, you know, to do best, best their operation. But when we talk about statistics, so statistics to me in terms of, of providing that quantitative information that, that can help understand the dynamics, you know, in a way, large dynamics and trends that uh, help to understand where the vulnerabilities of the crime, for example, is. Um, there is still a way to go for many countries to, you know, to go to the level of really uh, cross the line of open crime statistics. Um, and that uh, is uh, important in the trust because uh, the citizens, uh, uh, you know, in order to trust, uh, the citizens need to understand that uh, there is not a choice, a choice of the government what to release or not to release, but to really have that perspective. If it is really clear and open data perspective, then you gain the trust that say, okay, today is a good news, Tomorrow, if it's a, a, a bad news, it will still be released. So that is one. The other one is, and then it was mentioned also earlier uh, clearly, 
uh, is the issue of uh, um, if you want impartiality, quality, all of that principles that we need uh, in a data constellation. And I would speak about uh, finding a space for crime statistics uh, of uh, authoritative statistics. On purpose, I don't use the word official statistics. And again, Julia and I know what, uh, you know, often we mention, you know, we talk about official statistics, uh, but for the reason that you said, Mala, because uh, uh, today the trust in government and officiality on everything that is official uh, is not this, the same as it was 10, 20. Uh, and so just uh, the word official statistics doesn't have the same, resum you know, it doesn't have the same feeling as it was at that before. So I think it's important that we start to talk about authoritative statistics so that also to place they focus not on who produce the statistics, but on how the, produce, uh, the statistics are produced. Uh, and so that, uh, and in, in that constellation, in many countries, national statistical offices are the ones that provide that authoritative source. I mean, INEGI is a clear, is the best, most resource, and uh, uh, you know, on, on all standards, uh, among the best in, 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 that we can have, think about in terms of national statistical office, but it's not the same everywhere. And on crime statistics, we learn exactly what you present uh, for the report, uh, that uh, there is not only one institution that you can say clearly, and then you can tell the world uh, that institution is the one that uh, can help you to construct around it uh, that uh, information system. The same is for crime statistics. We learn uh, that in some countries may be a national statistical office, in another country may be another ju criminal justice institution. The important thing is that we select the most uh, authoritative. And then there is a lot that I would like to go on and on and talk about incentives that also was discussed before in terms of private sector. I think we need to think about also incentives for private, for public. You know, the issue of uh, reputational gain and uh, how you build this uh, around this. And the idea of uh, developing, I would think almost, uh, uh, you know, something like an ISO uh, standard that, uh, you know, and then uh, you can uh, and you have an independent evaluation and we have done on crime statistics. With the center uh, together with INEGI, we have helped countries in the region uh, to assess the quality of crime statistics uh, according to a very standard principle based on the fundamental uh, statistic, uh, fundamental principle of official statistics. So just as an example of uh, instruments uh, that uh, national institution can use uh, to improve their reputation. And I finish just to, with an example, uh, just to, give, to make it real uh, that, uh, uh, um, an example again on you know, how we, can, we have worked with the National Statistical Office uh, uh, to on a corruption survey. You know, corruption is the most sensitive, and we have heard many NGOs, but not only saying you cannot ask a National Statistical Office to do a corruption survey because the National Statistical Office is a state institution, and you're asking a way to evaluate a state function. But we have seen, and Inegi is an example that uh, has one of the best corruption surveys in the world. But we have worked with Nigeria, and I can tell you the difference that he made in terms of providing the authoritative information to help the Nigerian uh, institution to accept the data as authority and to act upon. Um, so that's, I get back to you because otherwise I can go on and on with a lot of uh, <laughs> issues. And uh, we can keep, we will keep listening. <laughs> but, uh, this, is, uh, this is all really interesting. And Angela, you talked about um, how, you know, it's important to, to improve trust. It, it, it's really critical, you know, to show how we produce these statistics. Um, and, and, and really transparency is going to be an important dimension. And, and there are a lot of questions from um, the audience on uh, sort of the role of open data. And I hope some of these discussions is sort of answering their questions. But since we mentioned what we talked about, how we're producing statistics, I want to pivot a little bit more because we do have a new actor in the mix, right? I mean, machines and algorithms now, which are crunching data and producing data. And um, there's, um, and so I wanna, I wanna turn to Rory uh, with more and more of these, with the digitization, you see that there are automat autom automated decision-making that are being done with artificial intelligence programs that affects people's uh, lives directly, whether it's machines, uh, that are deciding on job hiring, to borrow borrowing money or release of prisoners on parole. So uh, just picking up again on this point about transparency, I wanna pose this question to you, Roy, that what are the risks in, in with all of these new types of how data are produced? Um, you know, what risks is this posing for fairness and transparency for consumers and individuals? 
uh, including injustice itself. And and what do you how do you think it can be addressed? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, before before I come to that, I just want to throw a, throw a little pebble into the pond on the question of authoritative data because I'm I'm just very interested in um, the notion of a monopoly of truth uh, and the whether one risks trying to establish some sort of official you may not call it official but the more we call it authoritative the more we the more we risk saying this is guaranteed to be true and I my my sense of observing the way data is being used is that there are a lot you'll never get something that can challenge official crime statistics uh, directly but you might find information from social media or search results that if um, if it's analyzed you you pick up questions about the accuracy or gaps maybe in the authoritative data and i quite like the idea of some competition in the production of, of fact or information or truth and which tests if you like the authoritative sources or the authoritative mechanisms and forces improvements into them. Um, I don't know, Melara, is it, is it possible to, to throw that pebble in and see if Angela wants, has any reaction to that before we come back to the automated decision-making question? Totally fine with me. And, and I would also invite Julio if he wants to jump in. I, I don't want to like sort of... <laughs> no, first of all, when you were saying the idea of the truth, I'm not sure the truth exists. I think in a way, the truth is a bit overrated in general, because, and particularly on data and statistics, uh, is more living with uncertainty rather than to live uh, with the truth, uh, informa the true information. And, and so whether to aspire to the truth, because, uh, yeah, uh, it would be to aspire to, in that sense, uh, to a trustful source, in a way, a source that you trust is not manipulating, is not, you know, it's trying to do the best that can be made with the money available because there's always this, uh, you can do more and you can increase accuracy the more funds uh, you have. That, uh, I think, in terms of authoritative, uh, in, in that sense. But I, uh, it's interesting what you're saying on competition. Huh? And, uh, you know, we always see the role of NGOs, huh, of the civil society to, in a way, keep government, uh, you know, in place. And then, yeah, why not? You know, why not also uh, to think about in terms of the data that and the statistics that are produced? But I think uh, I, and if I were, but of course, Julio may have a different uh, uh, take, but if I were a national institution that uh, trusts and I think I'm doing the best, I would actually welcome it because it helps to build also that uh, uh, authoritative. If, if I may jump in here uh, to, to uh, answer uh, this pebble, I, I would um, welcome not only uh, competition in the production of, of data, but more in the accountability of official statistics and official uh, data. I mean, we like to have engagement with academics or civil society to question the meaning the accuracy of our data. I mean, what does it mean to have a 2% incidence of corruption? I mean, in what context should we understand that? And authoritative data, for instance, is very important in the geospatial dimension. We have to be very precise about, for instance, the, the location of a certain geodetic point in order to build a civil infrastructure. Or we have to give certainty about international or subnational uh, political borders. So that's a, a, an instance where we need authorities to settle down certain things that can uh, put a, a layout where many decisions are going to be made. I will leave it at there. Thank you. Well, do you want me to go back to the, the question about automated decisions? Yeah, and I think it's a nice segue that I mean, we can come back to this notion of accountability and some of those things, which was where I was pivoting towards the end to. So I'm glad Julia and Angela already brought that up. Yeah, please go ahead. No, no so you're, you're, you're absolutely right. An increasing amount of uh, decision-making across the economies are being made through coded uh, systems using algorithms, machine, machine learning. And, and one of the classic problems is, you know, it's really classic to any kind of complex machinery that's used is, is who's responsible. Is it, is it the designer 
Is it whoever fixed the settings? Is it uh, the consumer who drove the car too fast or smoked despite being warned it might cause cancer? You know, uh, fundamentally, a lot of this is about what sort of harm is foreseeable given the role that a, 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 an entity is, is playing in it. And, and this, you know, in the criminal justice system, we, we see the, the stakes are very high. In some cases, very high where uh, automated decision-making or at least uh, profiling may be used to recommend to a judge whether an individual is likely to commit a crime again. And, and, and that recidivism rate um, may influence the judge's decision on whether to grant parole uh, and for and when. Um, for how long a sentence should be and so on. And these are being used increasingly in a lot of countries. And, um, and they're based on data that's been fed into a system um, and, and individuals' lives are, are, are directly at stake. Um, and you, know, you see similar risks with use of facial identification systems, which have a lot of errors in them for inter interrupting people and arresting them um, on the basis that they look likely to be somebody who's, who's committed a crime and may permit one to come. So there's a lot at stake in some cases. And then another, other examples are you know, what music you prefer to listen to. You, other people like you listen to this music. There's a lot less at stake. Um, and so, so what we're needing is, is a way to handle the proportional um, uh, risk of harm um, and really to put our, our accent there. You know, the, the risk comes in the, in the profiling. Essentially, profiling is where you are analyzing an individual according to a much larger database that's been trained, where algorithms have been trained, used on input and data from the population, wider population. Um, where it has been able to identify certain behavioral traits that uh, correlate to, um, to, to, to attributes about a person, about, about the population. And, and from that, you can say, yes, this person is um, more likely to repay a loan um, or, or, or more likely or not to, 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 to commit a crime if released. And um, this sort of profiling is vulnerable in, in many, many ways. Um, uh, it's actually quite effective in some cases. In a lot of cases, it's, it's, it's improving and that's where companies are making money in the private sector, um, but it's still vulnerable. It's vulnerable if the data that's come into it, garbage in, garbage out. Um, if, it's, if it's based on uh, social inequalities that already exist, you may well find that an individual who, uh, about whom a good decision could have been made, maybe to disperse a loan to them, um, is lumped with uh, a, a bad credit risk because they're part of a, an ethnic group, a religious uh, group, uh, a racial group that has historically been disadvantaged and not been successful at repaying debt. So you may have a perpetuation of bias in, in the system. Um, you know, you, you, and you, you, you have, again, this may be less of a risk in a small enterprising little digital financial service provider that's just trying to break into the market but it becomes a much bigger risk if it's say Facebook, which has um, its own algorithm or its, its, its own uh, trade um, uh, patent over, over an algorithm which would evaluate individuals' uh, credit risk according to the credit risk of all of their friends on the social network. Um, and you can see how that kind of would, would suck you down the bias route. The other sorts of risks we, we see are, you know, do you think about the consumer, and then the black box of the system that's trying to make decisions about them. They can't see into the black box. They, it, it, it's asymmetry of, of power, of information. And, um, and if, if decisions are made that don't fit, you know, where's the explanation? How do you get accountability for complex systems like that? So the explainability of these systems is vital. And there's often talked about a trade-off between the more accurate you and deeper you dig the machine learning, the more complicated it is, the harder it is to explain the result. So the harder it is for the consumer to say, ah, but you got this wrong. Um, we should correct that. Now, some people have had ideas like Sandra Wachter at Oxford has uh, said, well, we could try to use counterfactuals. So you say, uh, if you didn't smoke, you would have got the health insurance policy or at a lower price. Or if you earned another thousand a year, you'd have had the loan. And these maybe empower the consumer to change their behavior, which might get different results. But Still, there's a lot of risk in the, in the difficulty of explainability. There's you know, risks around accuracy. I think we've talked about that. You know, just very briefly, what are the ways forward? Well, you, know, you can legislate and hold uh, organizations responsible for accuracy. So like Mexico's data protection law requires controllers to, data controllers to verify personal data in the database is correct and updated for the purpose that it was gathered for. You can build that into product liability laws and so on. 
you have is in regulation, Singapore Monetary Authorities built that into fin digital financial services rules, um, industry bodies like the Smart uh, Alliance's digital credit standards, which are being used increasingly across low income countries um, to build uh, a lot of ethics into that. And then you have uh, standard setting bodies and ethical organizations like the IEEE um, or some of the big tech companies which are wrestling with these things. Now, the way forward is clearly to really engage with the issues and try and resolve them and, and figure out what's best addressed at the level of law, regulation, or uh, development of ethics. Um, so yes, lots of risk. Again, we are all fumbling our way forward through this. Back to you. Thank you, Rory. No, uh, definitely. I mean, this just brings back uh, the point that Angela made, I think, that you know, while you're developing these standards and, and we all figure out a way forward, I think there is going to be a need for, at an international level and at the national level, um, either more established, you know, something more than coordination, more established governance that sets, sets certain um, rules and, uh, you know, more common thinking and vocabulary. So we're able to, you know, in a more productive manner, develop these standards. Um, so we're kind of at the final end of this really interesting event, at least for me. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of space to um, Julio. I know you wanted to talk, um, make some points on the on the need for disaggregated data. It's it's super relevant. Um, but uh, I would maybe uh, pose one question, but I leave it to you to kind of see how you want to uh, respond. Um, Julio, is that you know, at the center of all of this in the report, one of the things we discuss is central is, is also sort of this uh, changing behaviors or, or changing mindsets, more importantly, is within in all institutions and in this people, it's about uh, one uh, changing this, uh, uh, you know, to a culture of data use, you know, sort of making that a second nature and also improving uh, data literacy also, again, at all, 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 all levels of the society. Um, so I want to kind of just put that on the table, see, you know, that's a really hard thing to do, changing people, how they think, how they use data, what they think data can do. Uh, some people look at it as control, some people look at it as really they don't believe in the value of data. So I wanted to, because Mexico does so well, we always look up to you to see, okay, how do you do this? So I don't know if you can talk a little bit to that as well. Um, and again, Angela, I would, if you want to come in, uh, Rory, any, with any large, uh, last thoughts, but I'll give the floor first to Julio. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Malara. I think this is a very important question. Um, one of the fundamental principles of uh, official statistics is that data should be for the good of people. I mean, it, it's for a purpose. I mean, it's not only for the sake of knowledge. I mean, we have to make decisions based on these data. So that's why data and statistics should have certain properties about accuracy, about professionalism, about uh, methodological rigor, et cetera. And, and by the way, another principle is confidentiality, but I will not dwell into, in, into that part. Now, but data and statistics is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient condition in order to achieve the, the, the good, the, the, uh, the welfare implications. We need to have uh, good policies built upon this data. And that goes usually beyond the reach of national statistical institutions. So that's a part where um, the data culture, the data literacy is very important because uh, many authorities, many policymakers, many decision makers have to make a link between this data and this other decision. And that's where we have to come up as preachers of the, of, of the value of data and tell them, I mean, uh, if you want to uh, achieve this goal, you have to start by knowing the starting point of wh where you, 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 your initial point is, is here. And for instance, we have to uh, fight against alternative truths. We have to fight against the fake information uh, because we have to show what the reality to a certain uh, level of, of degree or uncertainty it is, no? And therefore, we have to make uh, an effort to reach everybody, local governments, civil society, uh, private sector companies, the federal governments, in order that they base the, the decisions on our data or the useful data that uh, we believe it's important for them. 
Thank you, Balar. Thank you. So should I, oh, yeah. When you asked that question, I thought um, maybe 15 years ago, we launched with UNDP a data literacy training course. And the whole training course was about uh, teaching not statistician or not uh, you know, data savvy people, understanding the sample size, understanding the error, sampling or sampling. I'm not sure today that would be the focus. If I had to think about data literacy today, I think uh, um, what is important today is to be able to recognize good and bad data and, uh, to, rec and to have to develop that skill because you will never develop the skill to understand the black box that Rory mentioned. So, you, and you don't need to, not everybody needs to be a, sci a data scientist or a, a statistician, but to, to give enough tools uh, to understand uh, when, uh, um, you know, a fake information or, or good, you know, the gray. There is not always, even in data, it's not that you have the fake, uh, often you may have, but uh, you know, and the perfect is, is, is to navigate in that uh, gray. And if I may conclude, I'm sorry, Malala, I wanted to make a, a pitch because next week we are actually releasing our WDR, that is the World Drug Report. And the slogan that we have for our uh, World Drug Day, I mean, on the 26th is the International Day Against Drugs. We have exactly share facts on drugs. And we are really focusing on that. We don't want to explain to people what to think, but we really want to, to um, and for people to understand that when they understand, I mean, this is the case of drugs, understanding uh, what the, the impact of drugs, the effect of drugs, et cetera, is not only to improve their lives, but is actually to save their lives. So back to you, sorry to finish with a bit of a slogan. <laughs> Um, I think we have just about a minute. Rory, if you had anything, uh, any brief last comments, you, you're welcome to. Uh, no, I, I, I was very struck by Julio's mention of alternative data and uh, which is, and, and, and Angela's point now about fake information. And I think this is a very exciting roller coaster we are on where alternative data has fabulous opportunity uh, uh, and yet it can get the wrong scary president elected or bad you know, decisions made at political levels. And this is the skill we've really got to build. It's how to, how, how to dig in. And it's not just a market that's going to solve it. And it's not government uh, being authoritative alone either that's going to solve it. And that's where we need, as you, I think, as Angela said earlier, we need to come together on all of this. Thank you. With that, thank you, Julio, Angela, and Rory. That was really a fascinating discussion. I'm sorry we couldn't get to a ton of questions that come on chat. We hope that this is going to be a continuing uh, you know, discussion. And Angela, good luck with the release of your report. Uh, I just want to again thank everybody on behalf of the co-directors, Robert Cull, Dean Jolie, Vivian Foster. Uh, have a very good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to everyone. Muchas gracias a todos y a todas por su asistencia. Sin duda, la generación, manejo y aprovechamiento de datos debe siempre acompañar la, de, la toma de decisiones del gobierno y apoyar a la sociedad para tener un mejor entendimiento de dónde estamos y hacia dónde queremos ir. Agradecemos la participación de estos importantes ponentes, a la modeladora y, por supuesto, a todos ustedes por acompañarnos. Mis colegas compartirán en la liga de, del chat, una liga en, en este chat, eh, y se proyectará el, el código QR que pueden ver ahora eh, para ayudarnos a evaluar la sesión eh, y así cómo registrar su asistencia a la misma. Recordamos que para obtener el certificado de participación deberán asistir por lo menos al 60% de las sesiones y esperemos nos regalen unos minutos para su tiempo. Les esperamos en punto de las 11.30 Ciudad de México a la sesión Datos, Análisis e Investigación para comprender la infiltración del crimen organizado en la economía legal. Gracias y muy buen día. Why do we need centers of excellence? Did you know that crime kills far more people than armed conflict? And organized crime alone kills as many people as all armed conflict combined. That only one in five homicides in 2017 were perpetrated by an intimate partner or a family member, yet women and girls made up 64% of those deaths. That also in 2017, an estimated 271 million people had used drugs in the last year, while 
35 million suffered from drug use disorders. That the majority of the detected victims of trafficking for sexual exploitation are women, but the majority of victims of forced labor trafficking are men. Or that nearly 7,000 species have been recorded to be illegally trafficked with no single species responsible for more than 6% of the seizures. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Are we measuring what is happening at the local level? How is crime affecting your neighborhood? How is crime affecting you? We cannot fight what we cannot measure, and no one knows their communities better than the ones who live in them. So the Centers of Excellence help institutions at the regional, national, and local levels to properly and systematically collect crime and criminal justice data, national data, and citizen-driven data. Data production. Data for peace. Data that leaves no one behind.